hear me? Hello? Hello, can everyone hear me? Hi, welcome. Um, just settle down. Um, welcome to Just Co and to She Says. This is our third event of the year so far, and we're very happy to have you all here, despite the rain. Um, thank you for coming down. Uh, just to give you a background about us, She Says is actually one of the biggest global creative networks for women in the, uh, in the creative industries. So we've been around for, in Singapore for about four to five years, and um, we are actually the local chapter that was brought here by Lizzie, uh, Mira, and Vicky. Mira is um, at the back there. <laughs> She's one of our panelists for tonight, so you'll be hearing a lot from her. Um, so we have a very strong network um, that's about 2,000 strong, and we are still growing every day. And we keep seeing new faces, and that's very encouraging for us as well. And um, so, okay, actually, I'll introduce our volunteers. We've got a few volunteers here tonight. Um, can you guys raise your hands? You'll see them uh, registering you at the door, selling some healthy snacks at the side, and helping us uh, with our social media as well. So tonight we're using the hashtag, hashtag she says SG and hashtag living strong. So if you're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, feel free to um, put out the word. Okay, and so tonight's topic is living strong and mental health in the workplace. And coincidentally, today is the International Happiness Day with Dalai Lama as the patron. We did not plan that. Uh, so we are hoping that today you guys will maybe learn something about how to take care of your mental health, how to live a happier, fuller life. Um, and also forgive us because we are super stressed. It's my first panel ever as a moderator. Um, okay, so uh, on our agenda, we'll have a panel discussion and then questions and answers. My name is Marta, and you know me probably as one of the volunteers. I'm always here, sometimes behind the camera. Um, I'm a creative project manager, formerly with Cisco, currently looking for new opportunities. And I'm Alicia, I'm on the digital and innovation team at Accenture, and I've been with She Says for more than a year now. Um, yep, so this is our team um, of volunteers and we organize um, alternate sessions each month of networking as well as panel sessions. So this would not be possible without all of them. And of course we'd like to thank our sponsor, Justco, for the event space. Farah, would you like to say a few words? Uh, welcome to Jesco. Uh, whoever have not been here before, Jesco is currently Singapore's largest co-working space. We opened up two years ago, 2015, and we have four now within CBD, opening up four more and literally dominating the region sector, sector in April onwards. So very quickly, uh, we have been uh, big supporters of She Says. Love them. Please join us more. Uh, we have alternate events at Jesco. Um, and yeah, just enjoy the night. Uh, if you see this little feedback form, uh, please fill in. Let us know how we can make this better, both for just uh, for she says and for Jessica. Uh, enjoy your night, ladies and gents. Thank you. Also, a shout out to our partner for tonight, Made Real. You can see some of the snacks. Um, displayed there on the table, one of our volunteers selling them. Um, Made Real is everything that we love about businesses. So it's female founded, it's health conscious, and it provides us with delicious food. Um, also, you know, it's scientifically proven that nuts and almonds and seeds are good for your brain and good for your mental health. So we'll encourage you to try some of those out. Smaller bags are only 250, so you know, try them out. Okay, and our tech partner for tonight supporting us, um, engineers.sg, they 
provide coverage from all the tech meetups and events in town. And you can go to their website if you want to see what's going on in Singapore and watch some of the sessions that you couldn't attend in person. And Michael there in a the purple shirt is helping us out and filming tonight's event. Okay. And the topic for tonight. So first of all, I guess good news. Statistically, Singaporeans are faring better when it comes to mental health than let's say citizens of the US. So you guys are like healthier and stronger. Uh, but still, you know, like the, the mental health of working Singaporeans, it's 13% lower than that of the general population, which means that work and balancing your private life and work, that's something that is extremely stressful. And we are all under lots of pressure. And then almost 10% of Singapore residents will struggle with at least one mood or anxiety disorder during their lifetime. So imagine 10%, that's one person out of a group of 10. That's definitely one of your friends or someone in your family. And you might not even know that. So tonight we would like to talk about early signs, how to notice that in yourself, how to ask for help, where to find that help, and then how to manage that, how to overcome that, and how to live successfully, even if you're under constant pressure. Okay? And we would like to invite our four wonderful panelists to take seats. Um, join us on the stage and introduce themselves. So give a round of applause for our panelists. Hello, I'm Tinging from Wonderful People. I'm a professional certified coach trained in a psychology modality called process work. Hi, I'm Liz Piper from Life Weavers. I'm an occupational therapist currently providing services in hospitals and in the community. Hello, I'm Marianne. Um, I'm Managing Director of Mana No Salt, which is a PR agency. Hi, um, I'm Mira. Um, I'm with Accenture and also part of the She Says team here. Okay. All right, um, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we'd actually like to start off uh, this session with a bit of a personal story from Mira um, about some of the challenges she faced um, with regards to illnesses and how she got back into the workspace after a brief period away. Mira? This is going to be fun. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Mira. Um, so some of you might know me. Um, I work at Accenture and I'm part of the digital innovation team. I'm also the loudest person in the office, so you're going to hear me like a mile away um, in most situations. Um, so jokes, I mean, one of the things that I do whenever I get uncomfortable or awkward is that I start making really inappropriate jokes or just comments that some people just don't understand. Um, so my background is that um, I actually have two brain tumors, one on my pituitary gland and one on my brain stem. I've had the one on my pituitary gland, which is where all your hormones come from, since I was 12. And then I got the second one about two and a half years ago. Um, and when I went in, when I first got diagnosed with it, I went to the hospital here and they told me it was a CrossFit injury. And so they sent me home for two months um, and put me on a ton of codeine and tramadol. Um, and I kept on going back to work and I was having really bad headaches and um, but I just kept on going to work and I just kept on telling myself, oh, it's just a headache, it's going to pass. Um, but then finally I went into hospital um, and it was, it was pretty, it was pretty nasty because I was in ICU for about three weeks and then in a regular ward for about three weeks the first, a month the first time and then the second time was two weeks and then another week. So I was in and out of hospital for about eight months. Um, I think when, when anyone talks about health, you have this assumption that the person who's seated next to you, the person who's seated in front of you, generally doesn't really have, doesn't really have anything to worry about. You've got it all together. You got dressed in the morning. You managed to do your makeup, got your hair done. But actually, it's probably one of the most, it's probably a very hard thing 
And I think to a lot of people, if you do know someone who's going through something, or if you yourself a person going through something, it's totally fine. Um, when I came out the first time, um, I had um, OCD um, because of the, the types of medication I was on. I had OCD, I had depression, anxiety. Um, I had suicidal thoughts as well for a good amount of time. Um, the mistake that I made was going back to work too early. Um, so when I went, took, when I left, um, you know, so I'm Singaporean and being Asian, I'm going to say like, you know, you're growing up and your parents, you know, if you tell an aunt or an uncle, oh, I'm actually going to take a month or two off work, they're like, huh? You're taking a month or two off work? How can you do that? You have to work. Then once you're, you know, it's a, a huge burden on your parents or your family or, you know, all the dramatics, right? Yeah, you know what I mean. So I just, but actually the mistake that I'd made was I went to work, back to work way too quickly. Um, what I would say, and I know Alicia and Marta asked me to think about a couple of things I would say to people in the room who have, who probably feel like you need to take a little bit of a time out or if you're having that anxiety attack, or if you're not feeling well, or haven't been well for a while, and you force yourself to go back to work, there are a couple of things that I would probably say about how I managed it. Um, the mis one of the mistakes that I made at the very beginning was um, I went back to work and didn't tell anyone that I had been sick. All I had said was, um, oh yeah, I just took some time out, wasn't feeling well, but now I'm okay. But what I wasn't telling people was, when I have a conversation with you at 9 o'clock in the morning, I'm not going to remember that you and I had this conversation by 12 o'clock because I won't remember your face. I won't remember the topic. I won't remember how long this conversation took. And I'm just not going to remember you. Um, but what I did do was I told my office best friend, and he was well aware of what was going on. So every time we had a conversation with someone who was new, he'd be like, oh, Mira, you remember so-and-so, we met them this morning where we talked about X, Y, and Z. And the other person on the other side would just kind of be like, this is a really strange conversation, but all right. But it'll pass. So be open with the people who are closest to you about what's going on. Um, I think one of the other things I also, I would probably say is, um, it's, actually, it's actually okay to tell your boss what's going on. The mistake... Well, not really a mistake, but the thing that I did was I did tell my boss, but I didn't tell him the full story. So when it came to the promotions discussion that was going on at the time, someone used the illness that I had as a reason why I shouldn't get promoted. So even though I've been working really hard for a year and a half, the fact I took six months off, I shouldn't be promoted because she took six months off. And the hiring and the promotions line accounts for a 12-month period not a six month period, so it doesn't matter that you worked your ass off in the first six months. The fact of the matter is it didn't work for the first the whole twelve. So honestly, that's that's the world that we're living in. And you need to be able to recognize that there are team members out there who are going to fight for you. So have that conversation with the people that are around you um, and know that it's going to be okay. Um, I don't want to kind of ramble on because I want really want to get into the panel, but um, I think my main thing is, um, so I'm the patient here, in a way, the mental patient here, but um, I would say that if you're having any fears, if you're having any anxieties, I still get anxiety attacks, so today on a regular basis, I get very nervous, and when I get nervous, I just can't get out of bed, um, and I have a tendency to get on WhatsApp and just generally text Alicia a lot at the <laughs> office and just have a mild panic attack about something. But just recognize, know that there are people out there who are going through the exact same situation that you're going through. You're not alone. And if you're ever facing any difficulties, just know that it will get better at some point, but you've got to give it time. So that's pretty much how I'll start, just to kind of open it up a little bit. Okay, so like when Alicia and I discussed this panel, came up with questions for our panelists, we really had some trouble about defining what we want to talk about, defining what mental health is, defining what all the problems that we want to discuss really are. So I guess I would like to first ask our panelists for a definition, maybe, especially the mental health professionals here. Um, 
what mental health is, what depression, anxiety, panic attacks really are, and how should we talk about that? How, like, what kind of proper language should we use to discuss that? <laughs> because um, my therapy modality is non-mainstream, so I think it's better for you to set the common baseline definition, then I just come in with my angle. Oh, okay. All right, so, <laughs> um, I, okay, I think I would start when we're talking about mental health is that often we have, um, we can perceive it as it's something that you either have or you don't. But actually, like mental health, we all have um, mental health. We all experience some form of mental health problem. Um, through our lives, we will all experience what it feels like to be depressed when we lose a loved one. Um, we will all experience anxiety if perhaps a loved one, if, we're, if we know a loved one is in the operating theatre and we're sitting at the door and we're waiting to hear that they're okay. So we can all relate to uh, mental health problems, conditions. We can all relate to depression and anxiety on a certain level. And I think it's really important for us to be really aware of that because that kind of makes it, for me, less scary. And I think one of the, I know we're going to talk about stigmas later, but sometimes when people become a little bit of afraid or, or of speaking about mental health problems because of the stigmas, because often people either don't know how to respond to it or they're worried that other people won't know how to respond to it. Um, when we're talking clinically about anxiety or depression, that's actually about showing a set of symptoms that relate to that condition consistently over a period of six months. So if somebody's talking about clinical depression, it means they've already passed that six-month six mark. But really, if somebody's experiencing depression for one week, that doesn't mean that it's to be discredited either. Um, so depression is when we're looking... Uh, more at feelings of despair, um, feelings of hopelessness, um, detachment. Um, uh, the separation with anxiety will be more about um, continuous worry. It can be a heightened sense of alertness and panic. We are talking about panic attacks before. Um, an inability to cope or deal with a situation. Um, so I think that's kind of like the covers the basics. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's a clinical textbook definition. Okay. Um, so I'm going to frame mental health very differently. Okay. So there's always something we want inside ourselves. And the thing is, how much does the reality match what we desire? Okay. So is there a congruence? Is there a coherence? Usually when it doesn't match, that's when we say, ah, okay, um, that's when I have a problem. Right? So the thing is, when you have that incongruence, so that's when we might consider I have a problem, maybe you do I want to seek help or want to seek some support to get the problems resolved. Um, and the thing is, mental health is probably is more like a representative of how well do you understand your inner landscape, your feelings, your thoughts, how are they coming together, affecting your action and creating the kind of reality that you want. So that will be my definition of it. So the, my good news is, Anything that happens, even if it's so-called bad, okay, undesirable, or it's like disturbing to you, it's actually a mirror for you to get back, to reconnect to yourself, to really discover what's really important, and put that into action. And I guess I would like to ask, uh, and maybe Marianne, you, you'll be able to answer that question, why are we talking about mental health in the context of workplace? Like, why, why did we choose this topic really um, so um, we were talking earlier about the flight or fight um, syndrome and I think the workplace is a very significant source of stress and um, let's be honest <laughs> um, and I think it's even more so if you're an entrepreneur which many of you are because the pressures come not only externally but also within you're just driven to succeed you don't want to fail you're just so kind of critical of your own success um, I, so in terms of my sort of experience, I've, I've suffered from panic attacks, um, but uh, I have conquered them, I hope, um, but they were all triggered by work. Um, and I think each time that they've happened, I've been sort of forced to the point where it's expressed itself physically, which is what a panic attack is, where you kind of stop breathing and you faint and you just want to be extracted 
from that situation, whatever it is. And if I look back on the places where I've had them, they're ridiculous. It's a workshop with a client, which was not, not great. Um, or it was just before a meeting where I knew I wasn't very well prepared and I just wanted to be kind of pulled out of that situation. Which, and you can't just say, do you know what? My head feels a bit doolally. I need to go and have a lie down. So you kind of force yourself. It's, it's almost like you bring it on, a panic attack on purpose, because a physical thing is so much easier to talk about and so much sort of more acceptable. It's much more acceptable to faint because you've stopped, you've stopped breathing or your skin's than it is to say, I don't want to be here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think workplace is a, is a really significant um, cause of anxiety in particular. And I think the fact that we, are, we, we, we need to be constantly on is a really uh, big trigger for that. You can never be off. You've, you know, even when you've got your out of office on, people kind of WhatsApp you. We've got clients WhatsApping us all the time. So multiple channels of people trying to get in touch with you. And that always on feeling, I think, is a big reason why we're seeing such a spike in anxiety. So um, based on that, what are some of the early signs and signals that we can look out for before it becomes a full-blown problem or before you get overwhelmed to the point where you don't know what to do? Oh, I had a burnout once, I experienced that. So I just caught myself having this pattern, having a big meltdown. First I caught it happening every about six months and it became more and more frequent. Okay, so um, I think another thing we can think about is our, our mind and our body, it's all connected. And a lot of times when we, like anxiety, um, it's a stress, it's a form of stress. Now when we evolved as human beings, stress is a survival instinct. So when we get stressed or we perceive something as a threat, it can be a physical threat or a psychological threat, what happens is our body dumps 30, around 30 hormones into our blood system, which gives us a massive surge of energy. And then this whizzes around our body so we can either fight off the, a fight off the threat or we can run away. And what we can start acknowledging is when we have those patterns, those surges of energy, when we start to feel, some people you'll see, they'll have like a tick. You'll notice they have like, they're twitching their eye, or they're, they're constantly tapping, or their legs are shaking, or something like that. And this is the body's way of actually trying to get rid of all, the, all that energy that has been just put into your blood system. So you can start looking at it from a physical, so you might be able to start looking at it from a physical level. And then the other thing that will happen is your, um, your digestion will be suppressed. Because if you're fighting something or running away, your body doesn't want to be spending energy on your digestion. So that stops. So you might start finding that you're getting tummy cramps and you don't know why, or that your, your toileting isn't as routine as normal, for example. You might get constipated or you might get diarrhea more often. So this can be another warning sign. And then the other thing that uh, happens when we're under stress for a long period of time is that our immune system is completely, almost completely suppressed. Because again, this isn't a function that your body needs when it's fighting for its life. So you might notice that you start picking things up really easily. You might be, I mean, I used to say I only had to look at a person to get a cold when I was working in a hospital, and that was quite a lot of the time. So your body will, will often give you these little warning signs, and it's very easy for us to kind of just brush it off. Oh, I just get sick a lot, or I'm busy, my digestion isn't like this, or I'm getting tummy cramps, maybe because I'm not eating properly. But maybe when we look a little bit deeper, it might be our body giving us that signal that um, we're pushing it beyond its limits for too long. Um, I think um, just kind of looking at the people that you work with, there were four things that always came to my mind. It's food, quality of work, the way that people connect within a team, um, and also just laughter. So when it comes to food, one of the things, um, so I, we've got a guy that we work with um, who shall remain nameless. Um, whenever he used to go through a breakup, he, you knew that it was, something wasn't right because he wouldn't eat lunch. He would literally just stay at his desk um, and he would just kind of mull over everything. Um, we had a, we, I've worked with someone who the minute she stopped arguing very quickly in meetings, you knew something was off because she was one of those people who was just like, I have an opinion, you will listen to what I have to say and no one's going to let go. 
you're all going to listen to everything I have to say. But when she was just like, yeah, sure, okay, all right, whatever. You knew something was wrong. Um, and also connecting. Um, whenever my team feels down, what I notice is that they kind of disappear off by themselves. It's either it's maybe more cigarette breaks where they'll just go downstairs and just kind of, you know, be smoking like three or four versus like going for one by, with a group of people or they'll go downstairs and take a ridiculous, ridiculously long time to grab a cup of coffee. Um, but I think one of the things that always does come to my mind is when people are doing that, don't immediately jump to the conclusion that they're being lazy or that they're not doing the right thing or that they are trying to kind of swipe corners. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of empathy for us to recognize that. But I'm a firm believer in tough love, but at the same time, you just, just keep an eye out, right? Because every, you know these triggers. You actually see them. But whether or not you want to accept that they've happened, just like when you accept something has happened, that's a different story altogether. Um, uh, in terms of symptoms as well, I think it's really important to know in yourself what are your own strange tics. And it wasn't until I've only recently realized that I have anxiety. My husband looked at me like I was mad. <laughs> he was, clearly saw it for a good 20 years before I did. Um, but just kind of spotting the links between all of the things that you do. So insomnia is, is often a very um, early kind of sign that, that things aren't quite right. Um, and, and for me, my husband will say, oh, you were scratchy head last night. And apparently I lie like this, scratching my head. And we used to joke about it, and now I realize that's when I'm at my most anxious. <laughs> um, so just kind of being aware of those funny little behaviors that you have. And for me, it's not just the physical things, which are you stop eating properly, your skin breaks out, you, you don't go and drink water because then you have to go to the loo and you have time to go to the loo, like all of these things that, that become these strange sort of patterns. Um, but also for me, I start to shut down from my family and friends because I'm just, I'm just full up to here. I haven't got time to kind of WhatsApp or reply on LinkedIn. I just kind of shut down to kind of cope. Um, and then my mom ends up texting me saying, are you alive? What's going on? So just really be aware when you can see those kind of things um, exacerbating and, and ramping up because that is probably quite a sign that you're heading for something that you don't want to happen because it, a lot of mental health seems to be about getting there before it becomes too big an issue. So all that being said, I would think that all those symptoms is something that I experienced, my friends experienced, and I'm very open about my own struggles. Um, I'm just wonder why the stigma, why all those negative preconceptions about mental health problems, why are we so quick to judge people when we all experienced similar things or observed our loved ones going through similar things? Hmm. I mean, it's a cultural thing. Okay, especially coming in Singapore, right? Um, we tend to be pretty masochistic on ourselves, right? We are hard workers, we're very industrious, we value that. Um, and there's very little in our upbringing and education about what it means to understand ourselves and being connected to our emotions, our feelings, how we think. So we are basically trained to execute and do. So it's a very systemic thing, but knowing, seeing that people are here, you know, there are conversations around, people are getting curious. What does it mean to be balanced, to be more holistic? So that's a good news. So it's turning around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think historically as well, uh, if we look um, way back into the, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, you know, we've got lots of like very nasty words to label mental health. Um, you know, and, and that's one of those things that has been built into vocabulary and we actually use, or, I mean, I'm not, we don't, we don't obviously, but some people uh, will use it to be offensive to somebody as well. And then we, we see in the media that the, the person that killed their family had schizophrenia or we see in the, in the media that this happened because, you know, they were, they were chronically depressed. And we kind of always hear those really extreme versions of what happens. Um, when s somebody has a mental health illness and, and it goes unsupported. So I think there is an element of fear as well. Um, sometimes people might see a crazy person and cross the street um, because they're scared of what they might do. Um, but 
yeah, now in, in recent times that conversation like today is being turned around that those are actually really vulnerable people and it's not right for us to cross the road. What we need to do now is, is lend a hand. So I think, yeah. In, in terms of the, the workplace, I think um, there's, there's a sort of preconception that having a mental health issue is a sign of weakness. And I think that's particularly hard as you get more senior because admitting a flaw or vulnerability is, is hard and you sort of feel like if you admit it, you might lose your job or you'll certainly lose your place in the pecking order or you'll, you'll always be labelled that one that had the breakdown, um, which you then think might impact you, you know, in sort of future times. Um, but I think um, senior role models are really important and I, I never speak on panel events. My colleague Alpha will know this. <laughs> um, but this one in particular, I've been out here six years, I've never spoken on a panel event. But this one I think is so important because I think it's so important for people to talk and to break down this stigma and to be, you know, to be a role model and to kind of share what it feels like. Um, I, I think just if, there is a, if there's a stigma, I think it just comes down to this is just me personally. Um, sometimes you don't, you, it's very difficult to admit that there's a massive flaw in the, in the matrix or the program or whoever you are as a person. We are trained and in, there was, there's a great TED talk at the moment about the idea of negativity. So there is this assumption that the minute you say, I have anxiety, or you make a negative comment about yourself, that you are someone who people shouldn't hang out with, or that shouldn't be on a team, because great teams are built on positive energy and you know, recognizing and always pushing forward. Um, and sometimes having a negative stigma, like saying, I have, I have anxiety attacks, or I have panic attacks, or there are certain days where I just struggle to get out of bed, or, which means I'm depressed, that people will assume that um, you're not going to be at 100%. Um, people don't understand it sometimes. Um, yeah, and so I think for, for me, I think a lot, and when I look at the world of consulting, consulting as a whole, we have a lot of people who have anxiety, who have manic depression. Um, in one of the consulting companies in Singapore, um, I, um, deep vein thrombosis and depression is um, uh, an acute, I think, I think it's acute depression, has the MDs in this one business, which is not essential by the way, just to clarify, um, it's uh, impacted one in seven managing directors or partners in this one firm. That's a huge number. And the fact of the matter is, if there was someone who was there to help them say, hey, it's okay, there is someone here who's going through it, it might have been a little bit easier. So we're talking about how difficult it is to be vulnerable, why it's still a stigma, and how difficult it is to open up. So what are some of the unhealthy ways that you've seen people cope, and how can those be replaced with healthier ways to cope with whatever you're going through? Okay, I can start on this one. One of my <laughs> three tips on the uh, Facebook page. So um, I can speak for myself, and I'm sure I speak for some of us here, that self-medicating with alcohol can be quite fun. Um, it can feel great uh, before and during, but usually feels a bit rubbish after. And I think the, the key thing when I'm talking about booze here is self-medicating. So I'm not saying if you drink booze or you, know, you enjoy your drink, that there's a problem. Um, that's not what I'm saying at all. It's about when you're feeling so anxious that the only way you can think about lowering those feelings is by having a drink. And that actually makes sense because alcohol is a depressant. So as a, as a, a medicine, if you like, it actually physically depresses those feelings, which is why it makes you, makes you feel better. So if you find that you're reaching for the bottle because it makes you feel that you can control those feelings, that's kind of a signal that something's going wrong. Now, when we start to depend on that as a coping mechanism, we start drinking more, and we all know that um, alcohol affects our ability to go into deep sleep. So then when we're not sleeping properly, we're waking up on an energy def deficit. When we go to work with an energy de deficit, what happens is we're more susceptible or we have a lower tolerance to stress. If we have a lower tolerance to stress, we're more likely to feel an anxiety. When we're feeling more anxiety, we're more likely to go down the pub and have a bottle of wine. 
So it's sort of identifying that. I think alcohol is, is one thing that is, is something that we can all relate to, which is why I would bring it up. But I mean, other people, there might be other things that people use to comfort themselves, like, um, you know, really fatty foods, for example, or like, you know, all that real feel good kind of like cheese and, and all those sort of things. Um, and so going back to what I was saying about the stress response, having a load of energy in your body when you're feeling very stressed. So the other side, dealing with um, anxiety and stress in a healthy way is exercise. And that doesn't need to be like thrashing it out for an hour at the gym. Um, it doesn't need to be, you know, doing training for 10K. It can be something gentle, it can be yoga, it can be going for a walk. In fact, my, my, my key advice for this would be during your working day, if possible, set a little timer on your phone or put it on vibrate if you're going to disturb others. And every 40 minutes, just stand up and walk to the other end of the office and back. Or stand up and do five squats or, or something like that. Once you start doing this and incorporating this into your work lifestyle, I promise you, you will start to feel a difference in how you can concentrate, your productivity, and also like your ability to identify stress and, and, and manage it in a healthier way. So yeah, be able to listen to your body. And alcohol doesn't always help us listen to our bodies. <laughs> so yeah. Um, okay, so maybe I'll share a bit about that resilience is like the buzzword in the workplace right now, right? But the angling of what resilience is nowadays is like you have to be very young, you have to be strong. Okay, this is, this is the usual connotation about what uh, resilience brings to mind in the workplace. Um, but recently there's an article that came out. So resilience is not so much about the young part, but the resilience is really are you um, doing enough to replenish yourself so that you can grow, continue to go the extra mile. So um, are you doing that enough? Do you know what turns you on? Do you know uh, what I call it? Do you know what your vitamins are? Right, your own essential thing that gives you energy, gives you joy, makes you feel engaged. Are you doing enough of that? Yeah, so it's not always about this. Okay. Um, for, for, my, uh, for my anxiety, the most useful thing um, was actually Pilates. Um, I'm not at all sporty. I hate sport, running, walking even. <laughs> Um, and I uh, couldn't really get on with mindfulness or yoga or anything, but Pilates for me, because it's so, it's so technical, you don't have space to think, so it just shuts, shuts down the voices, so I just find it really mindful. But I also know that when the stresses come with work, I will cancel or drop out. So I've deliberately bought a package of 20 one-to-one -one sessions that are all diarised, and it costs me an arm and a leg, but it means that I don't cancel it, um, because I know that my behavior is that I will I'll prioritize work and just not go, but I know that I need to for resilience. Um, so, and I've actually put it into my diary as a physio because I felt that people wouldn't book meetings over a physio appointment because that sounds kind of more serious than Pilates. <laughs> just giving away my trick there. <laughs> I'm carry on booking over it now. So prioritize it, put it in your diary. I love the tip that Ariana Huffington says about going to bed. So she says we set an alarm to wake up, but we don't set one to go to sleep. And I think that's such a, such a good tip um, to really kind of prioritize putting yourself to bed at the right time and treat it like it's a meeting. Um. I, I would have always said sport, um, like I love UFIT, I go to them way too often and I would always have said go, go for a run, go for a walk or something like that. Um, but um, this is like a really embarrassing fact, but there, one of, so one of the things when, um, when I got out of hospital was um, I'm, I'm, I was on steroids which makes you really hungry. There's a thing that you get which is called moon face where your face literally goes into like the size of a balloon. And so I was super embarrassed to like even walk out of my house. So when I came out of hospital, the first thing that I did was I ordered McDelivery four times in one day um, and went through about 100 chicken nuggets in one day. Like, don't, yeah, I, trust me, I know exactly, like I recognize that look, like trust me, I know, I feel it. Um, but yeah, I, I seriously ate to the point where I was just like, because you're so hungry, like at least that's for me. At that point, I was so hungry and I didn't know why. Um, but what actually helped me with kind of managing things was one of the things beyond a healthy body is a healthy mind. Um, and sometimes you might not necessarily be ready to talk to someone, but what I did was that I downloaded the New York Times, the Atlantic, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, 
and like a, I think a bunch of like um, um, liberal American or European and The Guardian, The Guardian. Um, and Vice News and I went through them and I made a decision every time I want to take a break or if I'm going to be doing something like going downstairs um, to you know get a drink or instead of going to a corner and bursting into tears or trying to order make delivery again or make a run for Krispy Kreme I'm gonna go instead and pick up the app and I'm going to go through four or five articles and that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to call my best friend. I'm going to make him listen to me as I tell him about what I read. And we're going to have a conversation about it. And bless his heart, he listened to me for a good, like, one and a half years. But so, friends, that's probably another <laughs> thing. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I guess um, the big thing that we wanted to talk about is how to create this workplace culture where we all feel that we can be vulnerable if our time comes, um, where we can talk about our problems and how they affect our productivity, which is a fact. Um, so what are the steps that we should take? And how can we make sure that our colleagues, our employees, if you guys are managers, um, that they feel safe? in that space and that we can start having those conversations. Because uh, we discussed that with Alicia before, um, employees often have those reservations and this is something that Mira mentioned as well. You are worried that if you'll be vulnerable, if you'll mention those things to your colleagues, something bad might happen at work, right? So like, how do we create that space? How do we talk about that? And maybe Marianne. Since you're a <laughs> I think it's quite important that it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, some people may want to talk, some people may not want to talk to their colleagues, and that's okay. But I think making sure that there are different ways for people to kind of self-medicate. So to just, you know, say, I, I quite like the expression duvet days, for example. It's not right for every organization. But something that just says, you know, it would be great if it was a mental health day, but just says, I'm, I'm, I'm off today no questions asked. Um, I think that's really important. I think encouraging things like um, flexible working. So if you're having like a really full on time, just being able to work from home or come in late or just be there in the afternoon to hang out with your cats at home is really important. And that means that trust is really important in the workplace, that you kind of trust your employees to, to work as they would if they're at home. I hate the kind of culture of presenteeism here in Singapore. It's, it's not the same in the UK. There is a, a different mentality to coming in and out of the office. I think probably because it takes about three hours to get in and out of the office in London. Um, so the flexibility and I think also just making sure there is a structural kind of safety net for people that you know, are, are becoming more sort of clinically depressed um, as well as those that are kind of just coping with stresses and pressures day to day. I think finally, the kind of leadership from the top is really important. So my own boss um, suffers from clinical depression um, and she's been very openly talking about it on LinkedIn to us as teams. And we've actually made mental health our kind of strategic priority as a company this year to put it into our values, our behaviours, to train our line managers so that they can talk about it and to kind of help each other in spotting symptoms amongst each other so we know what our kind of stress behaviours are um, and can just kind of help each other out a little bit more because we're all under the cosh, um, particularly in, in the kind of stressful working environment um, in Singapore. Um, I Sorry, what was the question again? Um, make it, talk it, about it. Yeah, sorry. I just had a moment. Um, I think one of the big things is, and I'm going to come from the perspective of someone who's like mid-level, working in a, more, in a, a very Singaporean firm, yeah? Um, it's, it, it, it's a bitch, honestly, to be able to go into the office knowing that you know, that most of your, you, th you might think that most of your bosses might not understand and they're going to be concerned because they're like, if, you know, if Mira is not in the office from 9 to 9 or have the capabilities to work from 9 to 10 every day, you're not an asset. You're disposable because I need someone who's going to be committed. Well, frankly, if you work in an office like that, you got to quit and if you're not feeling well because frankly, there is no point putting yourself through the hell of working a 16-hour day, and this, I'm going to be like a bit controversial here, but 
what's the point of working a 16 hour day if you don't have your mental health you just cut your lifespan down by like 20 years you're never going to be happy you're always going to be searching for something more and at some point you're going to go and take you know take off for a year and come out the back end of it just being like where did the last 20 years go my friends are all happy i'm not that happy so frankly if you're not i think that if you're not one of the things to do is at least for me coming again from a consulting background is you should be able to have a frank and open conversation with your mentor and with your boss they need to recognize that it is a situation and what I did was that um, I actually sent an email to my boss with my neurosurgeon's um, email address my neurologist as well as the people um, um, the oncologist and everyone who was involved in my case and I said this is the actual scientific case details. These are the doctors that you know, have background on my case. Um, in the event of an emergency, um, I won't be able to function, so I need you to get in touch with these doctors. Um, can you, you know, and that's just something to let you know. And then after that, I met up with my boss, Nils, for a coffee, and he was the one who actually approached me. And he said to me, so how are you actually feeling? So I, and I literally said to him, I actually don't remember anyone from this morning and I'm actually struggling to walk up the stairs because at that point walking up like a flight of stairs was like a marathon for me. So he was just like, right, okay, let's just sit down here and we'll have a cup of coffee. And so you need to be able to have that conversation with your boss to just say, it's not great. It's actually really, really hard. And if you don't get it, if he or she doesn't get it, then it's time to go to a business or go to a team within the business who understands what you're going through. And the, but at the same time, you can't take a victim perspective. You can't sit there and expect that everyone's going to bend down to your needs and to your desires. You just need to accept that there needs to be a balance. Things are hard. You need to work in an environment that caters to that support system. But at the same time, your history, your illness, your mental health does not define your future and who you are. That's only a situation that a hump that you're dealing with right now. It's going to get better, but right now you just need to have an environment or a support structure that's going to be able to enable you to get over it so that you can continue back on your mission or your overall life goal. So. So in my last organization, they had this quite um, useful thing. It was, uh, I can't remember what the proper name was, but we had like a mental health champion. And uh, this person had been on um, courses on how to basically be a mental health champion in an organization. And they were the, the person who anybody could go to with an issue. So it wasn't a manager, it wasn't you know, anybody in, in super seniority. Actually, it was kind of the, the person was someone who was tucked away in the office most of the time and nobody really knew who they were. So that worked out quite well for most people. And that they could go and talk to them. And you know, they didn't need to say, I'm having the A, B, C, and D problem, but they just needed to let them know. And then that person acted on their behalf as kind of their mental health liaison. So if they didn't want to go and speak directly to anybody or they were having issues with that, then, then they had that support and it was kind of a little bit impartial. So that started to, to work quite well. And I think something we can all do as staff on a ground level is try and um, uh, uh, like ask for policies to help with things like return to work, which has been uh, spoken about today. So having a return to work policy which means um, this might be after an illness, after an injury or even after maternity leave. So acknowledging that when somebody's had like six months off work, you're not going to be able to start performing at the same productivity that you were when you would, you know, when you were on a roll kind of thing and that you're going to need, you know, you're not going to be um, lumped with the same amount of work and especially when um, people come back from leave, I think we're all guilty of it. Sometimes the team members go, oh, great, they're back. You can have all your work back. And then that can actually uh, impede their recovery and how they reintegrate back into work. So just having that, you know, if people need to come in for half a day, a week, or, or whatever the arrangement needs to be. So trying to enforce, like, policies and um, official support systems like that can be good because then you know you've got that piece of paper to fall back on 
that it's actually there as an official thing within the organization. So you don't need to feel that you're being a burden or who do I talk to? You've, you've got that kind of set in stone. Um, so for me, I'm probably going back a few questions um, that we asked before. So talking about the history of um, psychology and diagnostic labels, so it's creating a chicken and egg, an official cycle situation right now, right? So historically, when psychology first came in, it's like probably everybody knows Freud. Okay, so it looks at how people malfunction. So that's when, you know, when we talk about psychology, the word unconscious, right, begins to ring, ring that bell. But by now, um, psychology has already gotten through a few cycles of um, paradigms, right? So departing from the dysfunctional view, in the 70s, uh, humanistic psychology came into picture about you know, how do people really excel and become better in what we do. And that's really um, the in thing now. So actually now it's what we call transpersonal psychology. So why, why this piece of information? Okay, so we are caught in this um, vicious cycle. The diagnostic label itself causes people to react with a person in a certain light. Okay, and that sometimes isn't the most helpful. And it becomes even more stigma for a person to speak out, this is what I'm going through. And pe that's why people don't say. So on one hand, I wish to uh, normalize that you know, going ups and downs is a natural cycle of life. We have all the peaks and troughs. And so it's to be compassionate, to be empathic, to hold a space where people are go simply going through their rough spots. And it's really um, nothing wrong in that sense. Okay? But also at the same time, having that diagnostic label is also, unfortunately, now what we can draw attention to about the seriousness, about what I'm going through, I really need the support. So now we are caught between, in, in between these two things. Yeah. So um, we understand an overview of why it's important to identify what you're going through and the importance of managing your feelings, especially at the workplace. We had some specific questions come in about um, being an inner critic to yourself based on you know, how we talk to ourselves like when we don't want to share our feelings with our managers or with our co-workers or our loved ones. And you put that pressure on yourself and be you know, your own worst enemy in that case. What are some of the things that you've seen around that and how can we deal with such issues? Okay, uh, inner critic, there are at least two categories. Okay, one is you created it yourself as your own. We, okay, honestly speaking, <laughs> when you are traveling to work when you're on yourself, right, we all hold conferences inside our heads. Okay, we all have little conversations, okay? So that sometimes when the inner critics come out and they start to like bash ourselves up, okay? Some of us are rolling our eyes already. Um, okay, one helpful thing is whatever is criticizing you, do a reality check. Okay, sometimes we make that into a reality. But, you know, are people really expecting that of us, right? Or we just assume. So reality, reality check helps. Uh, second thing is, if it's your, in, your, inner, your, own, you know, orga your own organic inner critic, right? Um, sometimes it's really just trying to be helpful, but not in the best ways. Okay? So this will require a bit of uh, more work to distill how the inner critic is really trying to help you. So like, you, you need to be more perfect, okay, blah, 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 blah. You need to be this, you need to be that. So maybe you, know, you just interview your inner critic back. What are you really trying to contribute here? You know, be, more con be more helpful here. Oh, okay. So maybe after some inner dialogue, it could be, yeah, sometimes you're a bit sloppy and therefore you know, being a bit more uh, precise about how you work you know, is really going to be helpful to you now and then. Okay, so once you get the message, okay, good. You can shut up right now. <laughs> I get you. Okay, and really bring it into action. Okay, how you can live more of that, um, that attribute in your life more. Okay, and, and so that voice doesn't really have that much power over you. Second category of inner critic is doesn't really belong to you, but is like a 
criticism you have received externally, but you have absorbed into yourself and you made it into your own voice. Okay? Like when I was about 14, I was just daydreaming in front of a food stall. Okay, so it was obvious to me that there were flies flying around the food and the teacher next to me just say, no initiative. <laughs> okay, then suddenly I have this label slap over me, then I have to live with this label for you know, most part of my life, right? So again, reality check, you know, is that... In a, first you have to catch it, of course, right? Is it valid? Okay, so be brave enough to have a conversation with it. Okay, do you really have a place for me in my life right here, right now? Okay, no, psh, go away. Okay. Just don't have that inner critic conversation with yourself out in public. Like, don't have that conversation. I've done that before, it's real, it's not good. Like, um, I think when it comes to the inner critic, so I was actually talking to Crystal just now um, about the concept of a mission. Um, I think anyone who says to you, um, you should never care about what anyone else thinks, you should only care about what you think. So they're a sociopath because everyone cares about what everyone thinks. We are human. However, what we should always be concerned about is what's your mission in life. And your mission changes with every stage of your life. I'm like, the mission I'm on right now is completely different to what it was tw two years ago, which was different to what it was the four years before that or the first time I entered my career, or even five, when I built my five-year plan um, when I was 25. Um, the one thing to always just kind of keep in mind, if you do have like an inner critic, is, you know, on your phone, um, so actually someone I know um, does this quite regularly as well, um, you on the notes page, I've got a list of like, what are the five or 10 things I want to hit by the end of this year and within the next two years? So every time someone comes at me and says, you know, um, why are you running the program this way? Or why are you running a client pitch this way? Or why is it that you framed or you are working on a project in a certain manner when the client wants something else? You need to go back to that list. That list is something that you've done for the year or be it for the project that you're working on. What exactly is it that you were meant to do? You're not here to please, you can't please everyone. But what you can do is ensure that the mission or what, if you're in account servicing or in a client-related uh, role, that you're doing what you sold or what you've promised to sell or promised to deliver, you're hitting all those notes. Same as when you go into the office. When you went in for your interview, you were very clear with your boss or your interviewee about what your capabilities were. But at the same time, you set the expectations on what him or her needed to do for you as a business. They needed to train you. They promised you that you were going to be taught certain skills. So as much as you're going to criticize yourself, ask yourself at different points, have all of those elements that have been promised to me, has that happened? Because to be frank, we learn only if we are allowed time to learn. And only if we are allowed to be, you know, allowed the time to learn those skill sets. If you don't, also, it's not something that your boss has to put aside for you. It's also time that you need to make on your own. So instead of shooting off at six o'clock to run to, um, you know, China Square, maybe it's about six o'clock to seven o'clock, just jumping on your phone on the bus on the way home and listening to that TED, TEDx podcast or learn, um, listening to Udemy or something like that about upgrading your skills or something. Um, I have a very, very critical inner critic, so I'm not really sure <laughs> I have a very good case study on it. Um, one of the things that's helped me is it's very easier in retrospect to identify when your thoughts have gone a bit loopy. Um, and <laughs> this is it's a trivial example, but very often with anxiety it is trivial things. Um, so I, there was, I, there was, my client called me in for a meeting and he said the topic was snow PR and I was like, <gasps> Google snow PR and I was like, oh, they're an agency in London, oh, we're going to get fired. I wrote up all my notes, I told the board, I was like, we're going to get fired, we're going to shut down our office out here. <laughs> Just my thoughts, like, da -da 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 -da. went in with my notes ready to be like, yeah, thank you, yeah, it's not you, it's me, we're both here. And he was like, so this is a briefing for the project snow PR. And I was like, the project is called snow PR and I was like, pulled my piece of paper away, put it back in my cupboard. <laughs> 
So that's been quite a useful thing for me because every time my thoughts get carried away and I'm calling my boss and saying something, I just, I've just exaggerated and just got into a spiral of like how bad it could become, which is what anxiety is. It's the fear, irrational fear very often of things that might happen in the future. And I've actually shared that scenario with him and he'll say just snow, snow PR. And it just brings it straight back down again. And it's, so it's become my kind of safe word, I guess, to just remind myself how to just switch my thought pattern into a kind of positive one rather than a negative one. So once you have got an example like that, try and capture it into a word so it becomes something that you can remind yourself of. I guess um, we have yeah, talked about uh, trying to think more positively about ourselves. And I think um, when we're being really critical of the way we perform or the way we feel we perform, one thing we're lacking is being compassionate for ourselves and forgiving ourselves. And um, I guess for me, the, the thing that, um, a little trick that, I've, that made it easier for me to practice being compassionate with myself was practicing the compassion I wanted to give to myself on others. Not to say that I wasn't compassionate to others, I hope I was, <laughs> but it was to make like, um, like a, a, a conscientious uh, a thing of it, to be like, okay, so one thing I really panic about, which is a bit strange, because I, I, I'm either really late or really early, but I, I'm, I'm bad at time management and I know that and I beat myself up about it. And, and, but then what I noticed I did is when other people were bad at time management, I kind of got annoyed with them as well. And so I thought, no, if somebody's late, I'm going to think, you know, maybe they're having a bad day, they missed the bus, um, somebody bumped into them, they helped an old lady across the road, made all the excuses for them. And then when they came in, I gave them a warm welcome. And if they were looking stressed, it was a case of like, I hope you're well, it's okay, sit down, whatever. And by practicing those little efforts of compassion with other people, I was actually then able to practice that compassion within myself. So for me, that was really useful. Um, I guess what I wanted to ask as one of the final questions in this panel um, is when a loved one is going through that, because so far we talked about how to cope when you are going through that, when your loved one is going through that, when your best friend is going through that, um, what can you do to help? You mentioned compassion, and that's probably like one of the main roles, one of the things that we should be doing. Um, but how do you support a person who's in despair? How do you support a person who's so deep inside their head that they don't even know that they need help? I spoke to my friend yesterday, and my best friend, she lives in Europe, so I only see her every couple of months. And the last time I saw her was around Christmas period, and she was her own cheerful self. And then she messaged me yesterday, and she told me that her partner has been um, trying to convince her for a year to go and seek professional help, and she finally went to a psychiatrist, and now she's in meds. And that was such a surprise to me because I didn't even know. And I'm sure it was so difficult for her partner to be the only person who could try to support her for that. So, yeah, I guess I would like to ask, like, what do you do when you're in this very lonely place, when you're the only caregiver or person supporting a person who's going through a like, very difficult time? That was very loaded. Yeah, I think the person who's giving the support could do with some support as well. Because um, sometimes when a person is in, 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 in the process of a, a low thing, um, when you just tell them out blank, you know, suggest to them out blank, point out you go seek some help, usually is, is a no. Okay, because nobody wants to be say that something's wrong with me. They don't want to consider that. So. Even healing, when they choose to heal, whether when they look at the problem, you know, it has their own pacing, it has their own opening before they would consider that. So if you are the one who has to support someone or be with someone going through that and it's difficult for you, so my suggestion is find some support for yourself first. Right. And so when the other party has that opening, then there's that time to go. 
Um, as a true occupational therapist, my advice is going to be activity related. So going back to talking about um, sometimes we get into bad habits um, or bad or routines that might not be that healthy. Um, Without even talking about the issues that person might be facing, we can always invite them to do like a, a healthy, a, a healthy or habituate a healthy thing. So um, every Friday, let's go for a swim together, or what, on the weekends we're going to go and go for a walk, or do something that is like uh, a healthy behaviour related. And by doing these things, by engaging in these things that allows us to kind of switch off, reflect, see things from a different perspective, is those times when we can slowly start developing a little bit of insight about ourselves. And just like you were, you were mentioning, you know, you can't push anybody to do anything they don't want to do. And if they don't have insight as well, actually, that, that's a very unfair thing to try and ask somebody to do as well. So it's about how can we encourage them to have those reflective moments and help them develop that insight um, in a really relaxed and, and comforting, like, caring way. Yeah, so activities, fun things. <laughs> oh. um, I guess from a personal perspective, um, just being completely non-judgmental non um, when they do open up or in, in, in any capacity. And also, like I've mentioned about anxiety, it's quite often tiny, trivial things, like snow PR, <laughs> that are actually just symptomatic of a much bigger kind of whirlwind that's going on. So I think not, not trivializing whatever it is that they open up to you about, because it is a cumulative thing um, that they're dealing with. Um, from personal experience, um, uh, when, I wasn't, when I wasn't feeling very well, my two really good friends kept on texting me, asking me, how are you? That really annoyed me to no end. I was just like, stop asking me how I feel. I actually feel horrible, but I don't want to talk about it. But what did work was they kept on sending me interesting articles, like fun shows to watch. I, you know, just, they showed they cared by recognizing what I love and then sharing with me those things that I love to do. But I think one of the big things is, as a person who you know, has a loved one that's going through something, they know that there's something, we know that there's something wrong. We're very well aware that we just want to lie in bed for 12 hours and watch Friends on repeat and literally have the covers over our head and not eat and not drink anything and just breathe and, not, and just be there. But what is helpful is when you finally want to actually say something and they just sit there and they don't try to find solutions. They don't try to tell you that, you know, it's going to be okay soon. They just listen. Now that and the activities, they come in time. But I think at the very beginning, it's just about recognizing maybe that person just needs their space. Check in, see if they want, like, I know with one of our friends, when he was feeling really down, we used to just drop off food at his front door. And so we knew that he was picking up the food because the food would go missing the following morning. That's the only way we knew. That and the fact that there was another empty bottle of gin at the front door. But that's a different story. But at the end of the day, food parcels, just dropping a text, seeing the blue ticks turn up, little things like that, they're okay, but they just need time. And when they're ready, they're going to come and talk to you. But just let them know that you're there and that you care. I think that's, a more, that's my perspective. So we've got a lot of um, good tips, advices, a lot of perspectives around various things from managing it on a personal level to in a corporate or a professional space. Um, we just want to open the floor up and ask if anyone has any questions. It's a safe space, don't worry about it. Um, if you have any questions for yourself or for, on behalf of anyone, um, please feel free. To raise your hand and just ask away. Yeah, we can also do, um, we'll have a networking session after this, so if you're not very comfortable, we can talk one to one as well. We've got our professionals here, they'll be around for a while more, um, and we can have a conversation with them um, if you're more comfortable with that. Question?
I have a, a request for the panel from one of my coworkers. Um, she's wondering, and actually I think I'm asking on behalf of a lot of people, um, how, how to deal with specific triggers like difficult people in the workplace. Um, are there any techniques or approaches that you recommend when it comes to dealing with uh, people or specific things in the workplace that might be causing you stress? I guess it depends what capacity they're difficult, but I think, um, you know, deep down everybody at work, they, they, they're all there to do a job and they all want to do their job well. And I think it comes down to trying to understand that person. You know, maybe you're at a loggerhead because there's something that is clashing or conflicting. But, I mean, what I've usually done when I have those issues in the workplace is I offer to take the person for coffee. So, and usually that surprises them because they're a bit like, why would you want to spend time with me or, or whatever? And, and the way it usually results in us finding some common ground and everybody's got some form of common ground. And I think when we're really busy, when we're really stressed, there might have been a moment when you were short with them and they're just somebody that hangs on to stuff. And that's okay because people that hang on to stuff are out there. I'm one of them. And there, and there are some people that are like, oh, you should just let things go, la, 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 you know. And it's about understanding that, you know, you're that kind of person and that's okay. And I'm this type of person and that's also okay. But it's about creating that environment where that can happen. Now, I mean, maybe I've been lucky. Usually I've taken people for a coffee. I've actually just explained to them, we're not getting on on the wards and I really want to get on with you because I value you as a clinician, um, for example. Um, and I think we could work really well together, but we're obviously not working well together. What can we do? Sometimes it is a case of, I just don't like you, and I don't want to work with you. Well, then we can both go to management and tell them that together, and we can have our space. But it's about getting that conversation going, and it is really hard, and I guess it, it requires you to be a little bit vulnerable and say, you know, this is where I'm at, but also it requires you to be prepared with your compassion backpack to be able to take that firing because they might be horrible to you because you've done something that upset them and you didn't mean to upset them but you might need to acknowledge that and they also maybe immediately or through time need to learn to acknowledge that they've upset you too um, and so I guess it's like a work in process there's no there's no easy way to answer that but from the standpoint of the person that's trying to make that effort is to try and understand why that person's being like that. And more often than not, you find out that um, I had a, another case at work, a different person. Um, they were being increasingly challenging to work with and it turned out her husband was having heart problems. And, and, and she was a difficult person when her husband wasn't having heart problems. And she was even more difficult. And, and, and that really made me think you know and I offered a hand of support and she says thanks but no thanks and the relationship changed so we're all human we're all good on the inside it's just finding where our common ground is and yeah it's tough um, I think quite often a big source of stress for those who are in consultancies is, is clients unfortunately <laughs> uh, where it is a transactional relationship because they are paying you um, to make you anxious or whatever um, I'm not sure I really have a solution to it, but I think the most important thing is to, well, with clients at least, you can kind of maybe move them around the agency. So I had one client um, who triggered one of my panic attacks, who I, he just caused me enormous anxiety. So I just, I, I had to say to my boss, I, I cannot work with this man. <laughs> I just can't. I have to be working on something else or to have something between me and him so that I don't have the daily connection with him. Um, and I think quite a lot of it is about looking into you as well and saying, why is this person making me feel anxious or stressed or under pressure? And trying to work out what's within you and whether there is a kind of pattern within yourself that you can change rather than attempting to change them. And I think also just being really open with your colleagues and with your bosses, um, if there can be something structurally changed, if that person really is causing quite severe anxiety or depression or issues. Sorry, I'm, sorry, one other thing as well, just really quickly. I think clients feel that they can invade you in all directions now, and uh, wherever you can, really try and own 
your time and your space and kind of make sure that WhatsApp, if you can, isn't a channel for your clients. So try and make it really clear which, which channels are on and which are off because then you've got a sense of control over your own space. Otherwise, it feels incredibly invasive and that's what leads, I think, to some of the mental health issues. Um, I think what... Um does help is uh, th there are moments where you're just kind of like especially when you're in client servicing you genuinely feel that the person on the other line on the phone is just there to make your life hell like they're there they she had a bad day or he had a bad day so now he's you know it's kind of rolling down onto you and you're like why why are we doing this on a Friday at 5:30? but I think um, I think that two things that kind of stand out with like amazing leaders um, especially amazing female leaders. One is compassion and empathy and actually recognizing that the person on the other side is human being. Um, we have a tendency, and this is the reason why wars happen, this is the reason why relationships fall apart. It's when you, when you stick by your guns and you say, I'm always right, you're always wrong, whatever and everything that you're saying is completely flawed because I do not like you. You're just, everything that you're saying is completely wrong. However, if you took it like a person who was fair and actually listened, you change the way that you're engaging because all of a sudden you're opening up and you're saying, okay, so why is it that you're approaching this conversation in an aggressive manner? So you don't actually need to ask that question, but then go back through the emails, go back through the conversations. The reason why your client might have been having a bad day is because maybe her boss or his boss has been coming after them. And she or he does not understand how to answer that question. So what they're coming to you as a consulting company is to say, they're not going to come to you and say, I don't know how to answer this. What they're going to come to say to you is, um, you know, um, team leader A needs an explanation for this. Why is it that you haven't given it to me? When actually what she's actually trying to say is, this is the answer that they want. I can't make it up and I don't know what to say. So can you help me? It's just a different way. It's under different circumstances. And also the second thing is being human. The person on the other line is as stressed out as, an, as anxious as you are. So if they're coming at you, there is something going on in the back. There are some people, unfortunately, who are just, you know, plain rude. But you can't help it that, like, with that situation, I don't know. But like. <laughs> okay, I have a... Um Interesting exercise, okay. Usually it's done facilitated. So now I'm gonna do, um, I have a quickie version, maybe you can try. It will apply to some situations, okay. So when you meet a person who triggers you, okay. So don't focus so much on your own, own reaction in this case, but just go and, can you pinpoint what's that particular attribute or quality or maybe energy about that person that really rubs you the wrong way? Okay, and in your own space, your own little exercise space, private space, pick up that energy, act it out yourself, okay, and ask, where do I need this energy more in my life? Even a little bit. For example, a demanding client, right? Okay, so of course, all the suggestion to build your own boundaries, advocate for yourself is... Okay, on point. But this is one other thing can try. Where do I need to be more demanding in my life too? <laughs> okay, so like uh, what I said, the disturber is actually the good news coming to you. It's trying to wake you up to new attributes about yourself, right? So you learn. So you can just say that universe send this person to you to learn how to be more demanding. Stand for yourself. Pick up the energy practice. So you will find your own expression of this quality. So don't worry that you will end up as nasty as this person. Okay, it will not happen. You will integrate this quality, you will express it in your own way and have fun with it in your life and see what happens and what you can do with it. Any other questions from... Um, let's say, um, personality wise, um, you're a mix of empathic and logical. Um, and as an empathic person, you naturally absorb a lot of energy and people's reactions, and then it affects your productivity. How would you suggest in compartmentalizing and being able to focus in those moments? 
Okay, for clients who are empathic, okay, because I, I work with people like that, you have to learn to establish your own mechanism to shut the empathic channels down. Okay, so maybe you can ask, is this really my problem? Do I really need to take this on? So at least have that chart point so that you can control whether I should be open to this or I, just, I can be relaxed and just close it and deflect back to the person. You, you still can be your caring, empathic in that sense, like care for them, but you do not need to absorb that. Okay, so this will require a little bit of work to, to establish that uh, boundary for yourself. I um, uh, recently was reading a nice little visuali visualization you can use for something like this, where um, you breathe in, take a deep, big deep breath in, and you imagine you're absorbing everything like a dark, smoky cloud. And then when it's inside you, you turn it into a glowing ball of light. And then when you breathe out, it's like blue white light that you're breathing out. Sounds like fairy tale or unicorn or I've been, yeah. But, um, but it, if you try it, you know, and nobody's watching maybe, <laughs> and you actually try and do the visualization, it can give you that feeling that you're having taken control of it. So you're naturally going to absorb it anyway. Maybe that's how you feel. And then you're also able to internalize it and bring it back in a positive way. So, yeah. Hippie stuff. <laughs> um, we have uh, time for a few more questions. Just a quick interruption. I think Mira has to make a move. She's got a conference call, work calls as usual. Um, thank you, Mira. <laughs> Okay, um, so back to our questions. Um, I think there was a question to... in the front somewhere. Yeah. Was yeah. there one more? So um, if um, asking for help requires some you know, degree of vulnerability, how can we encourage vulnerability in the workplace, especially when Usually, you know, usually you're kind of pressured to look strong and you have your shit together, <laughs> basically. But, you know, vulnerability will kind of make other people realize that, you know, you don't have your shit together all the time. So how do we encourage that more in the workplace? Um, well, I, th I think forums like this for people to speak out um, in offices is a really great place to start. Um, and having people, um, senior people, I think opening up first gives other people permission um, to, to follow. I, I think it's in some ways unreasonable to expect that it's going to be bottom up. I think it really has to be led from the top. Um, so making sure that leaders have a safety net and feel comfortable um, amongst their board members um, and then also that there's a kind of support system for people to open up. I think that I, I presume a lot of people have already watched the phenomenal TED talk about vulnerability. Um, it's, it's absolutely beautiful, but I think TED Talks quite often help prompt fresh discussions and, and, and different articles and kind of actively sharing things on the topic, um, I think can really help as well, because people digest things in, in different ways. I think it's also having a healthy conversation or a healthy attitude towards mental health itself, right? Um, this is a bit more philosophical, but it's coming from everybody have its ups and downs. I don't care you are a junior or you're somewhere out there as a CXX, you know. Everybody has gone through that and um, it's, it's normal. So vulnerability is one word, but I also prefer the word simply being open, that we're just being human and to have an open conversation about that. So because vulnerability also has the slant that, you know, you're, you're being weak, you are... It has the connotation. So maybe openness would be something that's more neutral, more inviting for people to simply talk about, no, we are human beings. So the thing about workplace is, um, for the longest time, it's been operating like a piece of machinery. We need to be optimized, we need to be great and perfect. So I really hope for the workplace is that humanity can begin to come in, that you know, we are seen as human beings running the ship, okay, and not piece of the nuts and bolts that's making the thing function. 
I think also leading by example, which is uh, what you're mentioning about it, it being good to have somebody at the top who's kind of saying, I am vulnerable and it's okay. I think all of us can go in and be like, these are my boundaries and I work nine to five and I don't talk to clients or whoever on WhatsApp after that time. And I think when, when you go out and you have the strength to show your weakness, because it's not actually a weakness. Vulnerability isn't a weakness. It's, it's a word that I guess we tag to weakness in, in some way. But it is openness. And we're not superhuman and we're not robots and we don't work 24 hours and we can't run off like rubbish food and, and no sleep. It, uh, and we kind of live in a bit of a society that tells us if we do that and we do that really well, we get a load of money. And some people do, and they're really unhappy, or some of them might be really happy. But I think the, the bottom line is to just practice being open with people. And if you're having a bad day, you know, when it will become infectious. That's the idea, that when you're having a bad day, you can say to someone, hey, I'm having a bad day today. Um, this is what I'm going to do, A, B, C, and D. Is it okay if you help me out with this or whatever. Or if you're in a meeting, you let your somebody know, I'm not going to be vo very vocal today, I'm going through this or whatever. And I think it's about having that, that openness. And I think sometimes we fear that because we worry about people abusing it. They think like, oh, if I'm too, some people are going to be like, oh, I'm mental health day, mental health day, mental health day. And, and I, I guess it, it's better for us to get there and then have that discussion rather than to use that as an excuse not to get there. So, yeah, I think being open and being able to have those conversations with your boss and if people throw it back in your face, that's okay because you've planted that seed and then the next time someone says it to them, they might think about it a little bit further. So even if it doesn't go the way we want in the first try, there's always going to be uh, more and more efforts towards it. Yeah. So many more questions. <laughs> okay, we'll just do a couple more because we would like some time for um, networking as well. Hi. Um, first, y'all, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. I just want to say thank you for sharing all the stories and your own personal accounts of what happened to you as well. So. For me, um, my name is Antoinette and I've been in the media industry for about nine years. So similar to you, I've seen my other colleagues also have panic attacks and we could not help them. So the only solution was to send them to Raffles Hospital because that's the only place that was next in line available. But that was $400 for a one hour session to just give them some help. So for me, um, I'm actually developing my own early intervention app and I would really like to share that with you when it's ready for beta, just to get your initial feedback and to see where I can improve on it. Um, it'll be ready in July, but just a your initial feedback will be great to see how I can improve it, especially for the Singapore market, because I think we really need it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> That's really cool. All the best with your um, initiative. Uh. Hi, my name is Z. Mm, for I think Singaporean or maybe people that uh, work in Singapore is really very stressful, where the anxiety attack is very common. So um, I am actually in the uh, aroma, I mean essential oil business, where I I dealing with few clients where. They, they admit of their anxiety uh, um, happened to them and they did have some uh, taking some uh, drugs probably that means the uh, medi medi medicine from the doctor to control so um, what is your take as uh, aromatherapy because I uh, when, when she shared this sort of uh, its situation happened to them especially at midnight they can be like suddenly wake up for anxiety for nothing, really nothing. Then um, heart pump, pumping very fast. And so with, um, because I studied the essential oils and I just uh, recommend them some of the things that they can help them. And eventually for the times being like few months uh, down to the road and they really reduce the reliance on the medicine. So what is your take like for a therapist for this, dealing with these people? 
I'm sure aromatherapy is one of the very good way and natural way to help this group of people. Mm -hmm. Just want to hear your <laughs> feedback. <laughs> Oh, right. Oh, okay. So I will say what my, um, not the founder of my school does, whoever works for the person is the medicine. Okay. Uh, I've hung out with aromatherapists. So, I mean, if you believe in herbal medicine, aromatherapy is also an extension of using plants, right? So there must be active components. So if it works for the person, it works. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much right. Yeah. And I think as well, different things will work for different people and it can be down to what you enjoy and aromatherapy can be creative, you know, you're like exploring what different smells you like, what you can mix and things like this. And, um, and we all know like about the placebo effect. The placebo effect is a thing and if it works, it works. I mean, it, it's great. And if it makes you feel better, if it changes the way you, you perceive things, if, if it gives you the perception that you have more control, therefore you're more equipped to deal with certain situations, then that works. And anything to get you know, people off medication if they're not comfortable taking it is a win. So, yeah. No. You don't like aromatherapy? Okay, <laughs> hey, I guess... Any more questions? For, oh, okay. I think one last question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm coming a bit from the other side. I actually do suffer from clinical depression. I've been treated for it for five years. I even went through electroshock therapy. Cue the gasp. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm in a little bit of a slightly different industry. I'm a financial advisor. Oh, good. No one's run away yet. Okay. <laughs> If you didn't know, it's a euphemism for insurance. Yeah. So I do have clients who come to me, and they do suffer from mental health issues. And I always try to be really open, because you know, I've been through all that, and I never shy away from telling them my story. Uh, I just wonder if I am sharing too much. Like, you know, am I coming to them with this like, mental health agenda, you know, and scaring them away, potentially? Like, if that's happening to my clients, then you know, what about in the workplace? Am I also emitting that kind of uh, you know, too strong of a uh, mental health, come talk to me, kind of aura? You know, is, that, is that even possible? So you're, just to clarify your question, it's about, by, you're, worried, or you're asking if by being too open, you might be pushing people away? Is yeah. that it? Um, well, it's... It, I would say even if you are, keep being open. Because at the beginning of these movements where we move towards further inclusivity, you know, we're, the reason we're moving is because we're moving away from something. We're moving away from the, the ignorance. So naturally, that, that is still going to be something that is faced in society. But it's about keeping that conversation going. And I commend you for being able to be honest and to be able to say that to them. Because every person that you say that to, even, even a person that shies away from you, they might be going through that. But they just don't know how to face the public with it yet. And their, their, social, their socially um, created behavior towards people like themselves is to shy away because that's what their mother told them to do or their grandmother told them to do, even though they're dealing it with them themselves. So I think it's to have the faith that by being able to be open about it in the way that you are, and thank you for sharing it today, you know, it shows people that, um, A, there, there is hope when you are suffering from such a condition that you can sustain a stressful job you can maintain a good career, you can take care of yourself, you can be articulate, you can be a, a human being that nobody would guess there was anything wrong with you. Wrong with you, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, and, I, and I think that's really important. That's really important to see because when people, we were talking about how the media um, has either intentionally or unintentionally portrayed certain conditions, you know, you are doing the opposite of that. You are giving the other end of the spectrum and I think that's a really powerful thing to do and if people have that strength I would 100% encourage them to use that and support each other and, and I think it's even great, um, waffling on, sorry, is um, 
when there is somebody that's open to that discussion, people that don't know much about it might feel that they can come to you and ask that question. So, for example, um, not so much about mental health, but when I first came to Singapore, I had lots of questions about Islam. So it's practiced differently, I think, or the, the way it seems to be practiced differently is, uh, is different to Singapore rather than uh, England. And I sort of was worried that it might be a touchy issue, so I kind of just ignored it. But I respected it, but I just kind of ignored it. And then um, I had a colleague who would speak openly, but non-pushy, uh, about her faith. And she was somebody that I could actually go up to and say, hey, can I ask you about Islam? Because I don't get it. And I've heard this, and that contradicts that. And I could actually be open with her. And she was able to calmly talk me through her views about it and not get offended. And I think that's really powerful as well. If somebody can come to you and say, you know, but aren't depressed people just lazy? Because for you, that's that moment where you're like, this is a point where a person's interested and I've got their attention and I can educate them. And that's really meaningful. Yeah, so Thank good you. job. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we're going to wrap it up. I just wanted to say that listen to your body, and if you have a pain in your back, or if you have trouble breathing, it might be something that you want to talk about with your doctor, okay? So it might be physical, it might be something anxiety-induced. Go to your doctor, speak to a professional, seek help. There's nothing wrong with you. But sometimes we just cannot overcome certain things ourselves and we need some additional help, right? We need a friend, all of us. Um, thank you to our panelists. Now I would like to invite Sarah, um, well, okay, our volunteer, uh, to share a few words about our social event. Thank you, Marta. Thank you to all of you for your insights tonight. Um, so just so that everybody knows, every alternate month, um, She Says puts together a social night where all of us can get together, network, make friends. And just on the back of tonight's event, I think it's a good thing that we have this next month uh, where all of you can build your own support system with the She Says Girls over here. Um, we all know now what we need to do as um, a collective society to move together to build a mentally healthy environment for everybody. And I think, you know, um, you can make use of the social night that we have next month um, to kind of build that society. Um, more details will be up soon. Um, just check out our Facebook page. We'll let you know um, on the location, time, and the date. And just, you know, just come down and have fun and make friends. All right, thank you. All right, um, so now we have a short time. We have the space so we can Network, if there's anyone you want to talk to, you can go ahead and talk to. If you want to talk to our professionals, you can ask them any questions that you have. Um, so we'll be hanging around for a while more. So feel free to chat, to have some snacks, some brain food. And um, yeah, just to relax for a bit. So thank, thank you, you so for tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you and so much for coming. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> Thanks. So absolutely, we need to get our selfie together with all the crowd, our Lizzie. traditional She Says Selfie. Lizzie. Yeah.